Okay, this is the second of the IMF staff notes. The first one we looked at about the economic principle for integrating adaptation into fiscal policies. This is about the macro fiscal implications of adaptation to climate change. Uh, these are very critical. I'm including them even though I'm not an economist. I'm learning as I go just enough to translate uh, the notes to you so that you can follow up based on your own interest in this area. But my thinking, my philosophy is that any adaptation is not going to happen unless there are financial resources available. And then we talked about the prioritization uh, issues in the previous podcasts. Here we'll look at the macrofiscal implications again uh, just to stay aware of the kind of models used to uh, you know derive these sorts of uh, ideas on how the microfiscal issues may evolve uh, let's read the summary as we did before for the previous uh, staff note one adaptation reduces climate change damages but it's but is costly and cannot eliminate all risks we talked about residual risks and how it, it can be underwritten or distributed governments have to decide on an acceptable balance of residual risks and to determine adaptation investments needed by weighing costs, benefits, and distributional effects. We discussed some of these ideas already, but again, to emphasize, this is what determines what adaptation, if any, will happen, especially in the uh, emerging economies and poor countries. A literature review suggests that well-designed and well-implemented adaptation can have large returns. This is always a tempting assumption, but whether the politicians or the people uh, in positions of making such decisions see such returns as worthy of investments up front. Global public adaptation needs in 2030 are estimated in the literature at around a quarter percent of the world GDP per year, but with very large disparities across countries and high uncertainty. These are critical. Which country can afford one-fourth uh, of its GDP or however it's distributed by countries. One-fourth of GDP for the world can mean a huge chunk for some countries. And there are uncertainties. As soon as we say 2030, we are uh, relying on the perception of future risks, which are very different for very different countries and very different cultures and people. Our analysis points to annual adaptation costs exceeding 1% of GDP for some developing countries and above 10% of GDP for small island, some island states. Many of these countries, despite typically not having contributed to global warming, which we must emphasize every time, face high adaptation needs while being challenged by limited fiscal space limited capacity or both calling for additional support from international community and how the international community will decide to help these uh, countries is not entirely clear but the sooner it becomes obvious that everybody is in this together and humanity is only as resilient as the weakest country then we will maybe do better to help guide national fiscal policies countries could integrate climate risks and the cost of adaptation into their macro, macro fiscal framework so we'll look at some models and how these uh, scenarios are evolved shock scenarios are useful to reflect short-term impacts of climate disasters while the long-term analysis of risks and uncertainties surrounding climate change requires scenarios that cover impacts from changes in both average and extreme events as well as adaptation policies right so future is what uh, all the problems are with in terms of projecting risks of the future and how people perceive them and even after perceive them there is talk but then decisions have to follow and especially actions have to follow and there is always this gap in going from assessments of risks to decisions uh, and actions. So let's start reading some of the details. Adaptation benefits costs and needs. Again, this uh, a series of podcasts in this topic are all text with just a couple of figures and I will read many of them uh, with some commentaries of my own. But remembering, again, I'm not the expert. You may want to follow up. There are lots of references given which are excellent that you may want to follow up with if 
you are interested in deeper aspects of these ideas. Climate change adaptation is the process needed to minimize losses and maximize benefits from climate change, which is rather obvious and intuitive. Despite all the potential benefits, adaptation cannot replace mitigation, as IPCC pointed out. So mitigation is required and there are many global efforts and often most of the focus is on mitigation like carbon capture, electric vehicles, renewable energy and so on. And adaptation tends to be very local and you cannot have a global footprint of adaptation. So mitigation is easier to deal with in that sense. Governments would benefit from starting to evaluate the macrofiscal implications of adaptation to climate change. Let's read this to uh, and begin to understand what we mean by that. Adaptation can help to substantially reduce climate change costs. So we already looked at uh, many podcasts we, I have on how climate action can actually benefit GDPs, especially if you stayed below 2 degrees instead of going 2.5, 3 or whatever. Uh, and there are always uncertainties in computing GDPs, especially for the future, because there are many assumptions, but nonetheless, they give you a very good sense of why uh, there is no option but to act on climate change uh, adap adaptation and mitigation. In the long term, well-managed adaptation frees resources and increases fiscal space if the reference scenario assumes unmitigated climate change impacts. So the reference scenario basically says the uh, business as usual will continue and climate change impacts will not be mitigated. Then how do you uh, free up your tax revenues for spending over things that are maybe more urgently needed at the current time than the long-term planning needed for adaptation. You don't want to spend everything on just managing the crises, whether it's from climate or geopolitics or other issues, but nonetheless you want to have a good well-planned adaptation plan. But adaptation competes for budget resources with other public programs in the short term and may seem to reduce fiscal space if the reference scenario does not include climate change damages. Okay, that's very critical. But how do you assess these damages is not very uh, easy, especially at local scales, because we don't have enough uh, knowledge to build such models and there are many assumptions get made to es uh, estimate the damages at local scales. The full cost of climate change is the sum of the cost of adaptation and the cost of residual risks. So after all the adaptation is do done, no matter how well risk informed they are and how well strategized and prioritized they are, Residual risks are going to remain. Climate risks that are either impossible or too expensive to eliminate will put additional strains on the economy and public finances. Governments can start planning for climate change by estimating and incorporating projected climate change damages as well as adaptation benefits and costs in their macrofiscal frameworks. So lots of work needed there. While all countries would benefit from this exercise, it will be most important for the vulnerable developing economies and especially in small developing island states threatened by both climate disasters and sea level rise. And these are the countries which have the least ability, capabilities to do such, uh, you know, carry out such an exercise. So there also they will need help, which IMF does uh, to a large extent. Assessing macrofiscal impacts of adaptation to climate change requires estimating climate change impacts and the effectiveness, uh, effectiveness and cost of adaptation. So this information is needed for governments to decide on an acceptable level of residual climate change risks and to determine adaptation investment needs. These decisions involve weighing facts and preferences, including society's specific ethical norms and risk aversion. While economic principles cannot be the sole criteria in this process, they can play an important role. So you cannot always rely on cost-benefit analysis and other economic principles that we talked about in the f last chapter uh, to decide on these. In particular, cost-benefit analysis complemented with an assessment of distributional impacts can help decision makers maximize the overall welfare by avoiding wasting scarce resources. Okay, So 
moving on to adaptation benefits so you have to kind of have a sense of these so that the motivation for investing in adaptation is already very well understood in terms of the adaptation benefits and in terms of the avoided cost of climate change so if you don't adapt and continued climate impacts and damages occur then what are the costs you would incur so it's kind of an opportunity cost in that sense the benefit of adaptation can be estimated by comparing the cost of climate change with and without adaptation obviously there are uncertainties but these are essential so using different combinations of climate change and socioeconomic projections allows for the estimation of adaptation benefits under a range of possible conditions so you hope that the scenarios cover the complete range of possibilities for the future such as arrival of another pandemic like covid may be not as bad or may be worse uh, impact of wars like the russian invasion of U on ukraine and how gdps are affected by that through the perturbations to energy markets food markets fertilizer markets and so on Estimating adaptation benefits is difficult and characterized by large uncertainties, but there is growing consensus that benefits are large. Okay, so these extremely high returns can be surprising according to some studies because they are assumed, for example, uh, long-term savings from investment in resilience coping and coping mechanisms can reach 300% for droughts and 1200% for storms in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, are these uh, realistic? What are the uncertainties? Uh, so there are obviously, uh, these are surprising about uh, as to how high they are. They cover programs such as disaster preparedness and public health measures with low costs and high benefits. They can also be found when adaptation is about marginal shifts in production such as when farmers switch crops or when improvements in building designs help prevent the collapse of large infrastructure. So you have to always see uh, the avoided costs very carefully because you invest in, let's say, uh, better designed infrastructure to deal with climate hazards and improving building designs for reducing energy use and storm damage and so on. Then how do you compute the marginal shifts uh, when such costs are incurred up front? Okay. In the case, for example, of the Empire State Building in New York, they, it was retrofitted a couple of decades ago, and they have tracked the uh, amount of energy bills that have been saved over time, and they think they have already recovered the cost, which was, uh, I suspect, a couple of hundred million dollars. Okay. As total investment in adaptation increases, adaptation costs are expected to increase faster than benefits, eventually leading to smaller net benefit so the later you do adaptation planning and implementation the less will be the benefit but obviously that doesn't mean people are going to rush to invest based on the information they have on hand it really depends on the country its uh, resources and ability to uh, implement adaptation plus its cultural uh, perception of the risks. Netherlands is investing a lot on uh, sea level rise and floods, for example. California may be investing more on energy, renewables, vehicle standards, etc. But Texas may not be, but Texas has lots of wind and solar energy, which is doing for economic purposes. And now with the tremendous heat waves going on there in June of 2023, it's clear that renewables are saving them from power outages of the traditional uh, sources of power. But how do you translate that into uh, continued action on climate adaptation? That's not always easy. While figure one is based on a comprehensive literature review of global climate change cost estimates, all studies share limitations that likely underestimate total climate change costs. So this is a, a kind of uh, issue that is argued both ways. You are making several assumptions to estimate cost of climate change, which includes the uncertainties in how climate will change in the future, how that will depend on human actions, policies, socio-technical transitions, 
uh, innovations of new technologies and you know especially bioenergy and carbon capture so there are lots of uncertainties so sell the sell the idea that climate change costs could be much higher than already estimated is not going to be easy so furthermore these estimates are global costs expressed as a percentage of global GDP costs in developing countries in, in, and in small vulnerable economies are much larger as a percentage of their national GDP and they may be the ones most focused on economic growth as a prime objective burning whatever energy they can get like coal and not worry about externalities of the impacts of coal burning on health on productivity, labor uh, hours, la daily labor lost, and so on and so forth. Here is climate change cost estimation methods, percentage loss of GDP. Again, remembering these are global uh, estimates. So we are looking at uh, various tools, global mean temperature change with respect to pre-industrial level. So we're going uh, from one degree to 4.5. We are already at about 1.2 and we are expecting to maybe temporarily cross 1.5 because El Nino is happening this year. Plus enormous amount of wildfires are burning, releasing three times the carbon that usually is released by June of any year. So this is the number of hectares burned is also about three times the normal. Uh, so the combination of El Nino, global warming and wildfire carbon emissions would probably uh, take us beyond 1.5 and then we'll return next year. So it's not like something amazing new will happen, already extremes and so on are happening. But nonetheless, you can see that there are various tools of estimating these things. Uh, econometrics, we will look at and other. Uh, econometric cross-section, computable general equilibrium models and so on. So we will, and there is an integrated assessment uh, model, linear fit, etc. So you can see that percentage of uh, percentage loss of GDP increases, these are negative numbers here, uh, with uh, increased warming, which seems intuitive, but to translate these to local scales for vulnerable countries, small island states and so on is uh, not that easy. And it's not also clear whether global GDP numbers will motivate the uh, humanity to act globally together. So we have to wait and see all that. Uh, finally, in this section, reaping the full benefits of public adaptation projects will take time and capacity building. So this is something uh, we have to work on. So for example, in practice, the execution of sizable public investment in adaptation will at least face the same challenges as other public investments with typically large efficiency losses and with possibly larger losses because authorities are building capacity in this new area. So we will keep this uh, podcast here and leave it here, then come back and look at definition of adaptation investment needs and move forward with many more ideas about macrofiscal implications of adaptation to climate change. So see you in the next podcast.